such a certain a special position in the independence and autonomy on this issue. And I'm convinced that we can maintain that position while maintaining the proper balance of authority and state power. Before we begin to consider these important bills, I've got a few reminders for those of you who attended today. I think we have to Okay. Uh, I, think I think I'll just stay here and, and keep quiet for a while. Steve McCraw, Director of Texas Department of Publications. Great to have you here. Your position on the bill? Neutral. It's difficult for me to, for the reasons you stated, but I, uh, there's other situations where there's laws that are federally mandated, but they aren't codified by the state. Right. And uh, the law enforcement the state, we, we enforce state laws, we don't enforce federal laws. So and that's, you know, like, you know, we'll say on the topic that right. uh, and there's no concurrent jurisdiction or legislation that may, prospective legislation that may be passed. You know, therefore, we, we enforce state laws. That's it. Right. And it gets, we had a, a recent Supreme Court case uh, involving Arizona's uh, SB 1070 law, and it was a, uh, a decision made on preemption and, um, you know, what the responsibilities of federal law enforcement officers as opposed to the responsibility, as you mentioned, state law enforcement officers. Um, are we are we going to would those state officers have to go through any type of I'm assuming they would have to go through some type of training so that they figure out okay well this is a violation of, of uh, our state law in in contrary to the to the federal law. Well, yes, sir. Every in fact, after every legislative session, MT Close requires every Texas police officer. It's a review on those changes. So regardless of what those changes are, every police officer in Texas is afforded that training after the legislative session. After the legislative session. Yes, sir. And, and then um, somebody that would be in violation of, a police, a police officer that would be in violation of this, um, of this law, if implemented, um, could have their T-close license taken away because they're being charged with a, a class B misdemeanor? Um, you, know, but, you know, as far as the legislation, I'll let others comment on that, Representative. But the, the uh, you know, I, I, I can't say this. It's, it goes back to concurrent jurisdiction. Unless there's a state law, then uh, there, there's no authority for a state or local police officer to enforce it. Okay. So they don't have jurisdiction. Again. They wouldn't have jurisdiction. So how would we, how, as a law enforcement agency, how would something like this being implemented um, because the way, I, the way I read it, it'd be a violation of, this violation is a class B misdemeanor punishable by confinement for 180 days, uh, a fine of not more than $5,000 or both for a person who is a peace officer, state officer, or state employee. Do you have an idea who would determine that? How, who, who would arrest this police officer? I'm really not in a position to comment on who would arrest you know, someone on a federal charge. Right. Well, this would be a, a state charge. This would be a state charge another... if you arrested someone under a federal charge. <laughs> you 
you would arrest him under a federal charge? I'm just saying this is a, as, as I read it, it's right. a, this would be a state charge if you were to enforce a federal law. That's not a state law. Right, but I'm saying this, this particular bill, who would be the arresting officer, of a federal or state officer? It would have to be yeah. status, but, but I'd prefer not to, you know, get into the, it's, it's, at the end of the day, it's the will of the legislature and what you pass, we enforce. Okay. So we would have other law enforcement, we would have state officers arresting, you know, which could be a, a, a very good peace officer. Um, yeah, the very good peace officer would have to make an arrest on a, on a federal violation without the authority, which is what's being written, correct? Well. And, and in other words, as, as written, concurrent there is no concurrent jurisdiction. It's, this is perspective. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone else that wishes to testify on, for, or against House Bill 553? No further testimony on House Bill 8. And because he's also been very patient, uh, the chair lays out House Bill 1076 and, rep and recognizes Representative Toe to explain the bill. Chairman and members, Thank you. You've been very patient. It's my privilege to present House Bill 1076, the Firearms Protection Act. The co-author of the Second Amendment, George Mason, stated, to disarm the public is the best and most effectual way to enslave them. He, along with the rest of our founding fathers, believed that as good as government leaders could be, they also understood the depth of depravity that people who came into government were capable of. And they held that the Second Amendment was the bedrock of all of the constitutional rights, and if we lost it, we would lose our liberty and we would lose our republic. The 2007 Supreme Court case of the District of Columbia versus Heller, in the majority opinion, Justice Scalia revisited a distressing episode in American history involving free slaves and guns. And this is what Scalia wrote. It's very compelling. He said, blacks were routinely disarmed by southern states after the Civil War. Those who opposed these injustices frequently stated that they infringed a black person's constitutional rights to keep and bear arms as a means to provide for and defend their liberty, while the other side said that blacks had no right apart from involvement in an organized state militia of which they were not allowed to be a part of. The Supreme Court in the District of Columbia versus Heller ruled that the Second Amendment did in fact go beyond state militias and was in fact a personal right for all Americans. The Second Amendment is a guarantee for all Americans, period. Rich, poor, folks of any race, creed, um, of any faith, we all have a basic right to live as free men and women. During, during the early days of our war for independence from England, and again 100 years later during the Civil War, there's a scripture verse that was on the tongues of nearly every man under arms. It was Galatians 5.1 that states it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. That verse is a guarantee of man's spiritual freedom. And our founding fathers understood that the Second Amendment is a guarantee to man's earthly freedom. You know, just a few short months ago, the federal government stated that it would, in fact, infringe on our Second Amendment rights in respect to the size of magazines and the specific appearance of any style of rifle. And within a few days of that statement, my sheriff, Tommy Gage, who I'm so proud of and who's going to testify before you today, announced that neither he nor any of his deputies would follow any federal law that infringes on the rights of Texans to bear arms. And here's the problem. And Tom Glass is stated it over and over again, it places law enforcement in a terrible predicament. Now they're forced to choose between following a federal law that infringes on our Second Amendment rights or upholding the oath they took to protect and defend the Constitution against enemies, both foreign and domestic. 
House Bill 1076 answers to the rule, order, ordinance, or any policy under which the entity enforces a federal statute, rule, or order regulation that purports to re regulate a firearm, firearm accessories, or ammunition background check that does not exist under the laws of this state. Further, it also states in subsection 4H, a person who commits an offense if, if, underline if, um, um, in the person's official capacity, they knowingly, underline knowingly, enforces or attempts to enforce these federal laws that infringe on our Second Amendment rights. And we put that in there uh, under the insistence of local law enforcement to get, give clarity because we wanted to make sure that an out of control uh, um, DA where there's a dispute between the district attorney and, and law enforcement could not use this, this law to, to go after uh, another law enforcement person. We wanted to be very clear and put that to, to rest. In fact, it was, was it San Antonio law enforcement that spoke here earlier against a previous bill has come out in support of our, our bill as a result of that language. So we just wanted to put that to rest and, and uh, I hope that you'll, you'll move to support this bill and if I can answer any questions for you, I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> Reserve the right to close. Absolutely. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you very much. At this time, uh, the chair calls Michael Atkins with uh, Montgomery County Constable Precinct 3. It's good to have you here. Please state your name, your, uh, who you're representing, and Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Mike Lankins. I'm in favor of the bill, and I'm representing Montgomery County Constable's Office, Precinct 3. First off, I want to say thank you for this opportunity. It's a, an honor to be here, as the subjects of policing, the law, and firearms are all dear to my heart. Peace officers in the state of Texas have an extremely difficult and many times thankless job, whether it's from the bad guys on the street, the media, or the civil lawsuits. Legal ramifications due to possible federal firearms legislation would be yet one more obstacle to overcome. Much like when I joined the Marine Corps, when I became a police officer, I took an oath to uphold the Constitution, which includes the Second Amendment. Asking or requiring Texas law enforcement to, to participate in Second Amendment regulations contradicts the oath we swore to uphold. This bill would allow officers to continue their jobs and allow them to perform with a clear conscience and without fear. So again, thank you for your time and your support. Thank you, members. Any questions? Okay, we certainly appreciate you being here. Thank you. This time, the chair calls Michelle Byerly with One Million Moms Against Gun Control <laughs> testifying for the bill. That's a lot of moms. Yes, sir. It's <laughs> a lot of guns. <laughs> um, my name is Michelle Byerly. Um, I'm a wife, a mother, and protector of four wonderful children. Um, I'm a 4-H youth firearms instructor, and I am the coordinator for the great state of Texas for One Million Moms Against Gun Control, and I am for this bill. Um, I am here today to ask you to support it. It's a common sense bill. We cannot let Washington erode the very rights that our ancestors fought so hard for. When seconds matter, every second that passes seems an eternity. It takes a first responder an average of six minutes to respond. I live 15 miles from the nearest police station, so can you imagine my average time? And that's if you have access to a phone. As the head of the great state of Texas chapter of One Million Moms Against Gun Control, I am demanding the right to protect my children your children, all of our children, because the only law that will save a victim once a violent attack begins is the law of physics. The stripping away of our rights one by one will not ensure the safety of our children. 
It will instead turn us into a society full of potential victims. Our country, and especially our wonderful state, were not founded by victims, but instead by people who used the words inalienable and shall not infringe, and they knew what they meant. As an organization, we've seen our opposition passionately lobby to give up their rights to protect themselves and their families. It greatly saddens us that a mother would so willingly support any legislation that puts her children at risk. The sales pitch for gun control is that gun control advocates and gun owners agree. That's a complete lie. What we at One Million Moms Against Gun Control want to know is why there is no legislation that addresses criminals that break the law. All we see is legislation that limits law-abiding citizens. There is no law-abiding citizen that needs to be limited, period, in their rights. Criminals do. We need common sense solutions, making criminals not law-abiding citizens held accountable. And Representative Totes' bill is doing one better. It's standing up for us. It's protecting us in Texas. Are we in favor of a safer society? Yes, of course we are. Do we support gun control? No, because gun control does not equal a safer society. That is what one million moms demands the right to protect our children. When a pastry can get you kicked out of school, we have to reassess the laws we are allowing to be passed in this country. We cannot allow knee-jerk reactions to solve problems in our society. Our Constitution is not just a piece of paper. It is the word of our forefathers who fought through blood and tears to ensure our rights to a free land. We need to fight to make sure that it is no longer trampled on by an irresponsible government looking to be bigger than the people. Our rights, all of them, are being shredded to pieces right before our eyes. As mothers, we cannot sit by silently and allow the men and women who work for us to continue in this manner. If we don't stand up right now and fight for these rights, they're going to disappear. This debate was settled in 1791. That's, that's all there is to say about it. And we agreed with it so much that we quoted it in our own state constitution, which says in Article 1, Section 23, that every citizen shall have the right to keep and bear arms in the lawful defense of himself or the state. We cannot do that if you don't protect us from the gun grabbers in Washington. There is no place in the great state of Texas for the fear of firearms or stricter gun laws. I'm a youth firearms instructor. We start with safety and preach it all day. An educated firearms owner is a safe firearms owner. And I'm working to ensure that our youth are brought up to be educated and safe firearms owners. Why wouldn't you work to guarantee them that constitutional right? I teach a sport that is being taken away from them because someone in Washington has decided that they don't like it. We all grew up plinking at cans or shooting at skeet. And yet, now these children are looked at with contempt because instead of enforcing the laws on the books, we just work to make more laws that erode the very fabric of our society. I ask that you look deep into yourselves and realize that the only choice you can make to keep the great state of Texas safe, keep Texans safe, and especially keep Texas children safe, by doing all you can to make sure this bill passes and is made into law so we can continue to be free people, ones who are not scared to leave our homes at night or go to ch check to see what's in the garage. Don't take away any more of our rights, especially our right to keep our most precious possessions, our children, safe. Would we be here discussing a ban on the First Amendment? Is there any questions? Thank you. Next chair calls Warren to prom with Montgomery County District Attorney's Office. Chairman Creighton, members, thank you for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm here on behalf of the District Attorney of Montgomery County, Brett Ligon, to speak in favor of House Bill 1076. It troubles me deeply to say this um, as a lawyer and as a prosecutor, but I really don't think I said, could have said it any better. <laughs> I really feel the urge to sit down now. Um, <clears throat> but because I'm a lawyer, I won't. Uh, as, as a prosecutor, I'm sworn to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America and the laws of the state of Texas. 
Uh, that's what we do. Uh, that's what we're proud of. That's what we love. And I've been doing it for 25 years. As an immigrant to this country, I have a unique perspective on the United States Constitution and what it means for us. And for those reasons, I joined the district attorney in coming forward and supporting this bill. I don't believe we're going to see police officers arresting federal agents in if, if this bill becomes a law. I think it is a means to protect our society and to protect our police officers from being put in an uncomfortable position or doing something that they feel uh, constitutionally prohibited from doing. And I think this bill addresses that issue appropriately and it's very narrowly tailored. So with that, um, I will see if you all have any questions and I'll act as a resource if, if you all have any further questions. Thank you. That's great. Members, any questions? Okay, we appreciate it. Thank very you. Much. Thank you, Mark. Okay, at this time, Chair calls Nancy Cresselius. Tell us how to pronounce your name. You pronounced it perfectly, Nancy Cecilius. Great, great. Uh, if you can, please let us know your position on the bill, your name, and who you represent. Okay, my name is Nancy Cresselius, and I'm here to speak on behalf of um, HB 1076, the Firearm Protection Act. My brother, a United States Army veteran living in Colorado, recently asked his state representative, what part of shall not infringe do you not understand, in one of his many letters to his elected officials. I've recently heard Colorado being described as the epicenter of the gun control agenda. And by the constant stream of email updates from my brother, that seems to be the case. The last thing I read was a statement on the El Paso County Sheriff's website. Sheriff Terry Makeda mentioned that he was disappointed last week when thousands of Colorado citizens showed up at the Capitol and were then turned away, unable to have their voices heard because of some last minute rule changes to the hearings that prevented them from speaking. Of course, the spouse of a victim of the Tucson, Arizona shooting, who is not even a resident of Colorado and hadn't even read the bill, was able to testify regarding what laws Colorado should pass. The sheriff also mentioned that the sheriffs in that state are now being threatened with their salaries if they do not go along with at least some of the gun control agenda. He specifically used the word extortion. Is this really happening in our country? Are citizens' voices really being silenced? In other words, their First Amendment right to free speech already being taken away while their elected officials discuss implementing their own political agenda by taking away their Second Amendment rights? Are elected sheriffs really being pushed to go along with unconstitutional laws that go against their oath of office? Unfortunately, the answer appears to be yes, and I'm quite honestly dumbfounded that this is actually happening. I can't believe how many people have no understanding of our Constitution and more specifically, the Bill of Rights and the non-negotiable freedoms it provides each and every citizen of this country. I'm very disappointed that our federal elected officials seem to be moving in the same direction of so-called gun control as if the Second Amendment is negotiable. The Second Amendment does not state that citizens have the right to bear arms, except for this type of firearm or this type of magazine, or only if they are on an official government list. Citizens have the right to, to bear arms, period. Are these elected officials really going to violate their oath of office and pass such laws or executive orders? I'm afraid there's a good chance that they will. If they do, I'm proud that with HB 1076, the state of Texas has the opportunity to not only protect its citizens' constitutional rights, but to also protect our elected officials and law enforcement officers should they ever be told to go against their oath of office and enforce an unconstitutional law or executive order that our federal government may enact. Mm. By definition, an oath is a solemn promise, often invoking a divine witness regarding one's future action or behavior. Every elected official in this country has taken an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. It is very clear that HB 1076 preserves, protects, and defends the United States Constitution for Texans. Please honor your oath and support this bill. Thank you. Okay, members, any questions? All right, thank you very much for your testimony. Next chair calls Sheriff Tommy Gage, Montgomery County Sheriff, that we're pleased to have with us today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee. Uh, certainly an honor to be here. Uh, 
My name is Tommy Gage. I'm Sheriff of Montgomery County, and I'm for this bill. And uh, because of the recent controversy and, and all over gun control, I had many citizens of Montgomery County and outside the county and even outside the state of Texas to email or call and ask my stance on gun control. I have on my website at the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office a brief letter, and I'd like to read that letter for you. As a sheriff of Montgomery County, it is my sworn duty to protect, preserve, and defend the Constitution of the United States and this state from all enemies, both foreign and domestic. The first time I recited the oath, was a newly, I was a newly appointed Houston police officer 42 years ago. I've been elected sheriff by the citizens of Montgomery County three times and have recited this oath each time. I take this oath seriously, both personally and professionally. In light of the recent and very tragic shootings across the United States, this country is embroiled in a debate over gun rights and gun control. It's a volatile issue that divides our citizens over the righteousness of one side over the other. I have received many emails, letters, and phone calls asking my stance as it relates to this issue. I'm happy to, to provide it. Murder has been a part of human society since Cain killed Abel. Taking guns away from law-abiding citizens will not stop murder. Reducing the amount of ammunition a, a weapon can shoot will not stop murders from occurring, nor will it necessarily reduce the number of people killed in a given a specific instance. A person's intent on the mass murder of people will find the means to complete the act, regardless of whether firearms are available or not. I am a lifetime member of the National Rifle Association, lifetime member of the Sheriff's Association of Texas, a Vietnam veteran, and a gun owner. I believe in the Second Amendment and will do my part to support all law-abiding citizens and their constitutional rights to keep and bear arms. I do recognize there may be certain revisions or improvements to current legislation that could enhance the safety of our citizens. I say may because I am not familiar with all the federal directives, policies, and orders related to gun legislation. I will leave the rule making to the politicians in Washington, D.C. as long as those politicians do not attempt to pass legislation that will further restrict the ability of law-abiding citizens and their right to keep and bear arms. I will never support any attempt by the federal government or act in conjunction with any federal agency to confiscate, to restrict, or restrict the possession of firearms by law-abiding citizens in Montgomery County. Thank you very much. Any questions? And Sheriff, if you, if you don't mind, what's the date on that letter? Did you send that uh, recently? Or? Uh, it's I, I don't I don't have the date here. It, it's it's been on there for uh, over a month. Yeah, our, I know our county is well aware of of, of, uh, of that letter and your position. It has been for months and months, uh, if not longer. So we, we appreciate your testimony and coming to the Capitol and being a part of the hearing today. Chairman, it's an honor to be here, and, and, and I appreciate what y'all do. Members, we have any questions for Sheriff Gage? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, at this time, the committee calls Doris Goldman, testifying for the bill. Hello. I am Doris Goldman, Chief of Staff for County Judge Sadler. I'm also a mother of father. Uh, father mother of four boys um, and a wife and I'm here in support of House Bill 1076 and I'm going to ask you as our representatives not to let anyone mess with Texas and our right to bear arms. As our Second Amendment says, a well-regulated militia being necessary to, to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Contrary to popular misconception, the Second Amendment is not about hunting or sports shooting or even personal self-defense. It is about a free people's right as a militia to take up arms against tyrants in defense of their inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The shot heard around the world April 19, 1775, which began the American Revolution, was fired in defense of this very right. The Bill of Rights is too important to tamper with. We can't just take it as a list of individual laws from which we can pick and choose from. 
The Bill of Rights serves as both a promise and a warning, a promise to the American people that we will remain free to govern ourselves and a warning to all others that we are fully empowered to do so. A warning that for over 200 years has told tyrant, conqueror, and dictator that as long as one American lives, so does our liberty. We have the right to own both, both guns and ammunitions. We have volumes of existing federal and state local laws that control how we get and use these guns. Whose fault is it if these laws are not working? If any kind of gun control is placed into law, I ask you, who do you think is going to follow it? A perfect example of that is what happened at Sandy Hook. How many laws were broken that day? At least eight that I know of. One more law regarding gun control, no matter how simple or how restrictive it is, will not keep people, and the key word is people, from who want to inflict harm, from inflicting harm on someone else. They will find a way to do what they want to do in their pursuit and break the law. Sandy Hook is and will continue to be on our minds as well as the other senseless shootings we have all had across our country. I myself live across a school, an elementary school. I've raised four boys who know how to shoot a gun and they know the proper way to handle it. If something happened either in my home or at the school across the street, don't think for a moment that I would not pick up a gun and pick up a weapon, a fully loaded weapon, while waiting for the authorities to arrive to protect my family and others that are in need. We need to have our guns and our ammunition. I was going to say some things that Sheriff Tommy Gage had written in his letter, but he was able to speak on it. Murder has always been here, and it will continue whether we limit the guns or not. With that said, if ending the senseless violence in our society cannot be done by our current politicians or by our current laws that we have in force, and with our law enforcement protecting us, who then can do it? I ask you, who can do the job? And if it's not y'all, how about us, we the people? Next chair calls uh, Kenneth Rowdy Hayden, Montgomery County Constable Precinct. Constable, it's good to have you here. How you doing, Mr. Chairman, committee members? Can please state your name and your uh, position, who you represent, your position on the bill. My name is Kenneth Rowdy Hayden. I'm the elected constable in Montgomery County Precinct 4. I'm here in favor of House Bill. 1076. I grew up the son of a Texas constable and now hold that position myself. In a community where most residents own firearms, like my father before me, I have a good relationship with our law-abiding citizens. There is a sacred trust, trust between us. And throughout my life, I've watched news from other countries where unarmed citizens are terrified of and terrorized by law enforcement. I thank God every day that I was born, not just in the United States, but in the greatest state in this country, Texas. I will not be a part of what I believe with all of my heart is the beginning of our transition to one of those countries. The right to keep and bear arms is guaranteed in our nation's constitution and our state constitution. And I refuse to use my position to trample on the rights our forefathers fought and died to protect. Just over 177 years ago, Santa Ana and his army underestimated Texans. When a small, poorly armed, but determined group held the Alamo for 13 days against thousands of well-armed Mexican army troops. The Alamo eventually fell, but it only strengthened the resolve of other Texans. Their courage and sacrifice became the battle cry Remember the Alamo. And that spurred General Sam Houston's forces to victory at the Battle of San Jacinto. Once again, Texans have been underestimated by people who don't understand us and mistakenly believe that they can take our rights away without a fight. House Bill 1076 will send a message to Washington that Texans will stand together and defend our right to keep and bear arms.
testimony. I'm sorry, Representative Kahn? Okay. Okay, at this time, Chair calls Brian Lambert, testifying for the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, my name is Ryan Lambert. I stand in favor of this bill. I know you've already seen me three times today. Uh, this will be the last time I speak. Um, I've already gone through how I'm a victim of gun crime in a country where guns are prohibited. I've already gone through that how tragic things like Sandy Hook are bad. It's not as bad as things like Tiananmen Square and 228 in, in Taiwan, Jews in Germany. And I, I've already discussed all that. Um, one of the things that I thought would be brought up but I noticed hadn't been brought up yet is that uh, when guns are prohibited, it hurts the, the weakest the most. Um, especially I'm thinking of my wife and women. I'm not a large man, but there's not many women that I could not overpower if I wanted to. Uh, however, if you put a gun in that woman's hand, all of a sudden it becomes a pretty even fight, even if I have a gun myself. Um, I've done enough gun training to know that you really don't want to get into a real gun fight because you never know how it's really going to turn out. And so guns empower uh, women. If, if they're taken away from them, uh, then I, I fear that they'll be the victims most often. Uh, I also stand in favor of HB 1076, mainly because of its Class A misdemeanor uh, wording. I know there's been some controversy over that, and I would have spoke in the first bill if I wouldn't have known it would have been such a, a controversy, because I know that it seems like I may be preaching to the choir now. The reason why I support it is, I'm sure most of you have heard of the uh, Milgram experiment done in Harvard in 1963, where they took two people were in on the experiment and one person was the subject. One person would issue orders to the subject, and the other person would be acting behind the scenes. And the way it worked was any time the actor behind the scenes answered inappropriately, the subject of the experiment was supposed to deliver a shock. And the shocks increased, and to the point where the actor behind the scenes was screaming in agony and pleading for mercy, and the authority figure would just tell him, you have no choice, this is part of the experiment, continue on. The horrifying thing is that 65% of the people did it, believing they were truly harming the person behind the scenes. And a matter of fact, it became such a controversial experiment because of the mental anguish that the participants experienced from going through it. The reason why this experiment came to be was because he was trying to answer why did good people in Nazi Germany do the bad things they did when they were in the military. I think, or I believe, <coughs> that HB 1076 actually helps our police officers here in Texas. Because they're going to be given an order and they're going to feel conflict on whether they should obey that order or not when the authority figure tells them so. But the state of Texas steps up as an authority figure and tells them, no, you do not have to uphold that illegal, unconstitutional law. It gives them support. And if I could uh, finish up with a, a final example, is in, in firefighting. We use SCBAs to breathe in, inside of smoke. And it used to be kind of taboo to wear that. The old uh, smoke breathers used to say, ah, oh, you know, that's, that's for you wimps. You know, we go in without a face mask. Even though firefighters were dying of cancer, because of the peer pressure, we would go in without face masks. Until finally, uh, regulation came down in the fire department requiring us to wear it. And then we could say, yeah, I know you guys think I'm a wisp, but I don't want to be suspended from my job. I don't want to get doc pay, so I'm going to wear my mask anyway. I think it would serve the same way for our police officers. They say, yeah, you, you guys may feel that way, but I, I really don't want to have to go to a prison or to court over this. And the state of Texas says I will if I enforce these unconstitutional laws. And so I think it will give them an out to do the right thing. Anyway, I finish. Is there any questions? Any committee members have any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify on HB 1076. Uh, I represent the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and we are in favor of HB 1076. Um, it's very similar to the Krauss Bill, HB 928, uh, and I think that the members have gotten a pretty good idea of what both bills contain. I, I'd like to focus on one thing that I think a lot of people, uh, especially in the public, are confused about, which is are police officers of local municipalities, local police officers, supposed to be enforcing uh, federal law to begin with? Uh, the Constitution makes the federal law obligatory for all courts, state courts and federal courts, but it doesn't impose any obligation on uh, state officials to, 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 to enforce federal law. And actually, as we saw uh, in the court battles over Arizona's uh, SB 1070, the position of the Obama administration is that state officials don't even have the authority to enforce federal law. Uh, they probably will back away from that in the, in the Second Amendment context. Uh, but uh, the, the, the important point is, you may have situations where municipalities are in the political control of a party that wants to impose, uh, impose uh, stricter gun controls. Uh, and, and in those cases, police officers may find it against, as you've gotten uh, some sense here today, police officers may uh, find it against their conscience and against their ethics to be implementing those laws. Uh, a, a rule like this, what we have in HB 1076, uh, would level the playing field and make it clear to everyone that uh, the, with respect to the enforcement of, of gun control, and it should be a general rule, let the federal government enforce its own laws and let the states enforce their laws. Um, that's better for everyone. It's the position of the Texas Public Policy Foundation after looking at this very closely for several years is that the principle of separation of state and federal government uh, should be, needs to become as cardinal and as accepted uh, as the separation of powers within the federal government. Uh, and so because S uh, HB 1076 advances that, the Texas Public Policy Foundation uh, very much supports it. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Members, any questions? Appreciate your testimony. Thank you. This time, the chair calls Tammy McCray. I'm here, I'm, my name is Tammy McRae, and I'm here on behalf of uh, J.R. Moore Jr., the tax assessor collector for Dunley County. Um, and uh, upon arriving this afternoon, well, first of all, let me back up and say I'm in favor of this bill, as well as J.R. Moore. Uh, and upon arriving this afternoon, Rowdy um, was the first person I encountered, and, and he informed me that uh, there had been 45 minutes allotted for me to speak because the committee thought JR was going to be here. Uh, and so for those of you that know JR, uh, you know, 45 minutes would not be enough time for him to speak. So you're ha you have me. Um, I am from Montgomery County, from the Woodlands. Uh, I'm a wife, a mother, and a nana. I am the Chief Deputy of the Montgomery County Tax Assessor Collector's Office. And um, my husband and I are gun owners, uh, including rifles, shotguns, and pistols. We shoot recreationally, we're hunters, but primarily we own guns for protection. We, uh, I come from a long line of responsible gun owners. Jeff and I have passed that responsibility on to our children and grandchildren as it was passed down to us. Um, we live in a structured society with rules and regulations which are observed by the large majority of the citizens. These rules and regulations have withstood the test of time and are guaranteed by our Second Amendment rights. Um, I don't believe that the federal government has a right to restrict our constitutional rights beyond the regulations already adopted by our state. Um, as I've stated, I work for the tax office. Um, our office is responsible for collecting property tax and registering motor vehicles for Montgomery County. Um, we bring in 87% of the revenue that funds Montgomery County budget. Um, in doing that, millions of dollars flow through our office. Uh, this year we anticipate topping a billion dollars coming through our office. Um, so with that, the safety of our employees and our customers are always our number one priority. Um, we have various forms of security in our offices, 
but our best line of defense has always has and always will be our local law enforcement officials. Our branch offices are located in the same building with all of our constables. We do that for security reasons. We've had to call upon them and other law officials uh, many times in the past, and thank goodness they've always been there. Um, I'm personally acquainted with many of our Montgomery County law enforcement officials. As I look around the room today, I see a lot of the faces. I don't want to see them put in the position of having to choose to follow some federal regulation or protect me and my family, or, be, or worse, be held liable for failure to enforce those regulations. Further regulations will not deter people with criminal intentions from carrying out their acts, but only prevent the law-abiding law citizens from having the ability to protect themselves, ourselves. Crimes such as Sandy Hook are an unimaginable tragedy to me as I am the grandmother of three elementary age grandchildren. However, these crimes are the result of societal and cultural issues and not a lack of gun regulations and will not be prevented by restricting our Second Amendment rights. I urge the committee to vote for this House Bill 1076, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Okay, members, any questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. This time, uh, Chair calls Judge James Betts, Justice of Peace, Precinct 4, Montgomery County. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, the members. It's an honor to be here. I'm speaking on behalf of myself. My family, and in the words of Ted Nugent, a lot of buddies. <laughs> a wise man once said, the highways of history are strong with the wreckage of nations that forgot about God. They are also littered with the remains of people that had no weapons to defend themselves. Now, as human beings, we have a God-given right, and as Americans, we have a constitutional right to defend ourselves, our family, and our property. In my opinion, we are blessed to have our God-fearing Governor Rick Perry, Representative Steve Tope, Representative Cecil Bell, and you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Brandon Creighton, whom I believe all of you know and understand these rights, and also know that we cannot and will not stand by and allow them to be infringed upon. Now, in September of 1975, years before he ran for the office of president, the great Ronald Reagan wrote a column that appeared in Guns and Ammo magazine. In it, he said the gun had been called the great equalizer, not only because it makes a small person equal to a large person, but because it ensures that the people are equal to their government whenever that government forgets that it is servant and not master of the government. When the British forgot that, they got a revolution, Mr. Reagan wrote, and as a result, we Americans got a constitution, a constitution that, as those who wrote it were determined, would keep men free. He said if we give up part of that Constitution, we give up our freedom and increase the chance that we will lose it all. In summary, Mr. Reagan said, I believe that the right of the citizen to keep and bear arms must not be infringed upon if liberty in America is to survive. Ronald Reagan is gone now, but the words he wrote nearly four decades ago are even more relevant today when our liberal leaders have forced us to draw a line in the sand to protect, to protect our most basic rights. As a lifelong Texan, a longtime public servant, I cannot speak for those in other parts of our great country, but I know my state and its people. This time, let me be clear, Mr. President, we are not helpless. May God bless America, may God bless Texas, and those of anybody who supports and defends the Constitution and laws of this state. I support this bill in favor of it strongly, as well as those I mentioned before. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. God bless Appreciate you. Sir. Your okay, next committee uh, chair calls Lynn O'Sullivan. Please state your name and your position on the bill. Uh, my name is Lynn O'Sullivan. I am here uh, with the Texas Patriots Pack as a volunteer and as well as myself, and I am in favor of the bill. Um, as a member of the Texas Patriots Pack, we have a set of core values, and in those core values, we state that we believe in limited government, free markets, and upholding the Constitution. 
as an individual, as a volunteer in that organization, those are applicable to myself as well. Uh, I volunteer there every day and uh, work to ensure that the state of Texas and the world that we live in is the one that we want it to be. Uh, I am in no doubt that everyone in this room is in support of the Second Amendment. I don't think I've heard anything from anyone that's contrary to that. Um, I have heard uh, some references to uh, elected officials as being Congress critters. Uh, you frequently hear the word rhino thrown around. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with that type of language because um, I don't think you folks got in the position that you're in because your critters are uh, anything derogatory. Uh, we put our faith in you. We've put you in a position of considering and passing laws that are the best for the state of Texas, and I entrust you with that. Um, I want to lean more towards uh, the, the bill in question. Um, I think it's incumbent upon you as legislators to protect our peace officers, to make sure that they have every tool that they need to enforce the law. The only uh, question I really have heard today has been uh, officers being arrested. Well, in conversations, and I will call you Steve, I've known Steve a long time, uh, he has assured me that the purpose of this bill is to protect those peace officers. And who doesn't want that? Um, I believe he has worked with the Attorney General to make this as airtight as it can possibly be. Um, I believe him, he's convinced me he had peace officers from San Antonio in his office earlier in the day while I was there. They came opposing the bill. They weren't very respectful, wanted to visit with uh, Steve. They visited and left convinced that they didn't need to testify against this bill. So uh, I urge you to do what's right by the citizens of the state of Texas, of which I am a native Texan, by the grace of God and urge you to get this out of committee so that this can be law in the state of Texas and we can get on with other business that needs to be taken care of. Thank you. Okay, members, any questions? Thank you. The chair calls William O'Sullivan <coughs> with the Texas Patriot Pact, testifying for the bill. And please, again, if you could state your name and Bill O'Sullivan from the Texas Patriots PAC. Uh, I am uh, testifying in support, support of the bill. My father uh, was a Marine officer. He's also a retired policeman. I am a Marine officer and active. Uh, I served in Vietnam. My father in World War II. My son is currently a Marine officer on active duty. We take seriously defending the Constitution. I look to a, a different amendment of the Constitution to talk about this and talk about how it affects uh, people who have to use guns in defense of themselves. I look to the Fourth Amendment. I think the Fourth Amendment, amendment within it permits you to be safe and secure in your home. Okay, And I think that uh, it doesn't specifically say that, but as has been adjudicated, the Fourth Amendment has uh, emanations from the, the number. So that has already been decided by the Supreme Court. So I think in the emanations of the penumbra of the Fourth Amendment, you're permitted to be safe and secure in your home. And to do that, you choose what weapon you want, you think best fits to do that. Now, I don't know how many of you have been involved in actual uh, shooting. You can go up and shoot any paper target. It's not going to shoot back. But when, when things go, get very excited, uh, you, you lose a certain capacity because of the amount of adrenaline that's, that's flowing from you. And for that reason, I would, you know, for, for defense of my house, when I have to leave my wife, I would prefer to have a weapon which had a pistol grip, have a short, relatively short length barrel, and have multiple shots. 
So rest it in your shoulder in a short range so you can aim and fire. And if you want to see the difference, I suggest you go to, go to a range and shoot with a pistol at 20 feet and shoot with a weapon which has a pistol grip, short barrel, and you can rest it in your shoulder. And you will see an enormous di difference in accuracy. Accuracy su suffers in excitement. So for that reason, I think you have to define the weapon you want and use it in your home. As far as uh, you asked a question, Mr. Wally, earlier about fearing uh, that they would pass a bill. I, I don't worry about the bill passing because things happen in Congress and there's all kinds of rules of that. I fear regulation more than anything else. Where somebody in ATF would come up with a regulation which they would pass. Uh, and it's creeping re regulation that gives, gives more than anything else. The last thing I want to talk about is the lawful order. As an officer, I had only had to follow lawful orders. You here, by this bill, are defining lawful orders to the police officers and, and the uh, elected officials in terms of the district attorneys, et cetera, for the laws of Texas for the state of Texas. So those are the orders they have to follow. And I think this bill draws clear, bright lines for those officials and those police officers. Thank you. No, well, you can have a short barrel shotgun, but people's confidence with a shotgun would take a lot of training. So what's the firearm that you describe? I, I, I would have an M4 Colt. As a weapon of choice. As a weapon of choice for somebody in, in any firefight. But you know where I'm going with that. There's been a lot of discussion on different, different definitions of assault rifle. There's been different discussions on what is a tactical weapon. What I'm, again, when you're talking about moving, you're going to be in your house. If you're going to be in a situation in your house, you're going to be in a small area. So you don't, you don't want a, a long barrel weapon for panning, just for panning purposes. And again, you want three points of rest. Pistol grip is a lot more comfortable to, to me than, than uh, grabbing uh, along the stock. So, uh, you know, it's for that reason I would, I would, I would use that again. Uh, an M4 is a low recoil weapon as opposed to a shotgun. And it, I think it would be a very smart weapon for a woman to use in a high pressure situation.